special joy for us at Calvin College to welcome Sandra McCracken back to campus. It's good to have Thanks you here. Thanks so much, John. Wonderful. Thank you, guys. My name is John Whitley from the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship, and it's actually very fun for me to be a part of this conversation this afternoon and also to have students here from both my college and seminary classes, as well as other friends that are here. And then um, we're going to wave to the online world because we know we're live streamed for this conversation. So we're grateful for the opportunity to be together. Let's, uh, let's begin in prayer. Lord our God, we give you great thanks for friendships old and new and for the way you grace our lives with uh, stories of your grace in people's lives. Today we especially thank you for Sandra, for her music, uh, for her desire for pastoral service through her music to so many people. And we pray that you will encourage us today in our own life of faith and ministry as we uh, talk and learn together. So be active by your spirit in our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, welcome back. And uh, I'm wondering if we could start, uh, Sandra, by just talking a little bit about what you look forward to sharing with us later tonight and some of the things that are really on your own heart and mind uh, in your ministry of music and concertizing these days. Thank you. Well, um, yeah, it's really, this room is such a beautiful space to do what we've um, been traveling around doing. This is called the Vespers Tour. Um, and borrowing from this word, this Vespers, this word that is a traditional word in, in um, liturgy, mm -hmm. and um, just bringing it into a creative space with music and prayer and um, kind of a contemplative setting of the songs, which is new for me and it's new for um, like I, I'm coming from a folk genre, I think, as, as a vocation, and as I've been a musician in my adult life, um, finding my way into the church, maybe through the side door, or through the back door in terms of music, mm -hmm. and yet in that I um, have found um, so much freedom in what it is to create space for people and to try to just kind of put... Um, like a musical setting that allows people to come in and bring whatever they bring and to enter into prayer or to have their hearts stirred and opened before God and to have a conversation that is um, not formal or stuffy, but that is uh, that has that spaciousness. Hmm. So it's designed that way and um, has come out of many months of prayer and um, on a personal level, it's answering the question of what do you want to say? What do you want to offer to the world? And I'm humbled by that question, and I'm not very comfortable with the question. In the Gospels, um, Jesus will ask people over and over, um, what do you want me to do for you? And I have never seen really, I've never really heard that question until the last few years, even though I've read these Gospels since I was a little girl. And hearing that question of what do you want me to do for you? Um, and beginning to have a dialogue hmm. and not to give empirical answers for you or for me, but to just enter into it and live in the space of that. And by way of music, I think there's a unique, um, you can cultivate a, a, a more elastic kind of space that you than you could with just talking or with just liturgy. Hmm. And so it's this kind of in-between, um, borrowing from a lot of traditional ideas, but also feels like a new idea and um, has been also in that same way very creative. So we're excited to be here tonight. It's a three-piece band and sometimes we have four, most often it's three pieces and, and we have a lot of interaction as we play. So there, even if it's the same songs every night, there's a lot of fluidity in how we make music together and that I think is even another reaffirming of those values of what we want to see happen. What are some of the joys, but also challenges of preparing for a contemplative evening versus a high energy evening? I mean, that's such a difference in both the composition of the music, but also your own preparation. Say a bit about the, the joys and challenges there. That's a great question. I would say my first thought is that the challenges are, um, are the challenges that all of us experience in our work is how to, um, get quiet and listen to the voice of God and to listen to our own hearts. Mm -hmm. And that sounds so kind of basic, mm -hmm. but when our lives are so noisy, the biggest challenge in preparing for a night like this is that you have to prepare by being still. Mm -hmm. So you have to live by 
um, you're, we're in, I should say we're invited to live by a life of Sabbath, a life of like resting in the provision of God and not in, and so that's what's coming out for me as a reflection of personality and interests and desire, but it may not always be that. There may be other times in my life that I just want to like throw a party and every <laughs> night feels like a party, a celebration, a, a feast. Um, this feels like this is just what it is right now, mm -hmm. but it's coming out of that restful attentiveness to what is the Lord putting on my heart. Mm -hmm. So they're very, it's connected to your first question in that sense. And, and the obstacles are a noisy life. Um, the obstacles are saying yes to too many things, more things than I can handle in a week. Mm -hmm. um, and how hard it is to say no to things that's like, oh, well, I could do that. It's like, well, <laughs> yes, but if you do that, you're actually saying no to something else. So your yeses Im imply other things that are limitations that are no's. And so finding um, the space to say yes to, um, to a day off on Sunday um, or turning my phone off overnight or um, taking a walk and mm -hmm. allowing no productivity for that walk, like not even just for exercise, but just walk. And those things are the things that make a night like this possible for hmm. me personally. Wonderful. And how do you find people responding? Um, thinking of the, the hunger in, in culture for spaces of quiet and Sabbath. But the response probably is, comes in different forms. So how do, you, how do you find the response to the contemplative Sandra McCracken uh, as, you, as you bring this around? Um, I, I've heard lots of... Um, People feel, sometimes when I speak with people after or in passing around the time zone I'm traveling, I experience that people have a hard time describing how they've connected to the songs. And mm -hmm. I think that they're connecting to the songs because these songs are so soaked in the scripture of God. So it's hmm. not that they're responding to Sandra McCracken, they're responding yeah. to these ancient words and, and by offering, like by sort of m my story being a doorway to it, then people walk in and they find that I can't meet them, but the Lord can meet them in that. Mm -hmm. And so there's um, sometimes people would describe comfort in it. The word comfort comes up a lot, healing, um, or people will say I, I people experience that during difficult times when they don't have other words, mm -hmm. that sometimes the place of music can, and especially music around the Psalms, around the scripture of God can um, provide uh, kind of like a safe, it's like a shelter, you hmm. know, when we, or it's a rock that we stand on both ways, like these images that kind of hold us and give, um, give us the ability to move through these difficult passages and troubles, and we are promised troubles, but we're also promised comfort and provision hmm. in them. We have been celebrating here with so many psalms that you've been setting over the past few years. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about your journey with the uh, Psalms of the Hebrew Scriptures and when you began to, um, in a more disciplined, intentional way, write so many, and then what you've been learning through this process. Yeah, thank you for asking that. Um, it's, it's more apparent in the last few years because there are albums that are kind of reflecting this, but as I reflect on it, and Psalms and the practice of Psalms came very early for me mm -hmm. and in my life. and. Even before I was born, they were already kind of resonating with my mom and with like different parts of my family story. And, and so I came into that line of, okay, here are these words that we look to when we don't have our own words. Um, I remember being in um, maybe 15 or so and on a hiking trip. Actually, I was turning 16, it was over my birthday. A really difficult hiking trip in Colorado and I'd never done anything like it we were carrying everything we were out in um, changing conditions you know it would be snowy we were camping on snow or walking through barely thawed out fr uh, s streams you know and uh, I felt so pushed physically and I remember carrying this Bible and just like kind of tears running down my face but clinging to those words and as I came home I realized, like, God leads us. There's this part in, um, in I was just reading, this was in Hosea, Hosea 2, and it says, like, he will lead her, I will lead her out into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. So there's this juxtaposition of the wilderness that is wild and discomfort, sometimes displacing. We don't know where we are or which direction is north. Mm -hmm. In those seasons of our lives, metaphorically or literally, 
um, he speaks tenderly to us. He is close to the brokenhearted. And this nearness of God that when we insulate and if our objective is to sort of insulate our lives, um, we, we miss those opportunities of pushing in toward uh, the discomfort that produces intimacy with God. And so I think for me, the Psalms in the last few years have been um, kind of like that backpacking trip when I was 15. They've hmm. been like right in my pocket and right beside me and sometimes with me in the middle of the night or in the morning or um, at every point in the passage for me. And, and so it's come out in the music. And if there's one on a, in, on a vocational arc, I think about how for years I've made a living as a singer-songwriter since I went to college. I came out of college and packed up my guitar and went to every place that would have me to sing, you know? And just began to make um, a life of that. And then in the last, maybe since I, maybe in the last 10 years, I'll kind of zoom out a little bit, but I think that in the last 10 years, the Lord has put an, a, a new call in my heart where I have a new desire to write and think about the songs that the church is singing and to want to write songs that sing us forward and that are very, very much like in the gospel tradition of songs that are honest about where we are and also hopeful about where we're going. Hmm. And so that that has brought out lots of new things and it's come by way of some sorrows in my own life, but not fruitless sorrows, sorrows that God has made fruitful um, by his good design. And in that, these songs like the Psalms album and God's Highway, and um, it just continues to be an inspiration to me that I want to write um, his words back to him and to hold his words and to embody his words. Mm -hmm. And I feel an urgency around it. Like, well, I don't know what else I would do, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, so. so I'm thinking about the process of songwriting um, and people describe this so many different ways. Probably a hundred songwriters have a hundred different ways of going about it. But the difference between um, writing a song that is mining an experience versus writing a song where the text is given where in some sense you're apprenticing yourself to this uh, text that is given. Can you say a little bit about that dynamic of you know, inhabiting something that comes from the outside toward you and what, that, what that's like when you want to make it your own through a song? It's hard to put words to that creative um, process. Mm -hmm. Like I've experienced it, but I don't know that I could teach it. Mm -hmm. it it's more like a thing that happens. So when I, if I were to write a song, um, and I still do, like if I were to write a song about my own, like a narrative moment in my life, you kind of put things in the song that are more like furniture, like a place, a city, or a description of how you, what you're seeing. Um, that has the same quality to me as reading a psalm and experiencing the psalm in an embodied way, like mm -hmm. you experience it in a personal way, as if it is the furniture in the room. Mm -hmm. And if it, I think it can be a discipline, it can be a craft in a, in a more methodical way, mm -hmm. but I personally don't experience it that, that way. It kind of just happens. Okay. Um, both forms, both narrative songwriting and like kind of scripture soaked or literature based songwriting is coming through the, trans like it's translating through m my own what my own eyes like how I see the world and what I've seen so when you read a text in the scripture and you have a moment that you're like that is that is I've seen this like I've tasted this mm -hmm. um, whatever your vocation is I think that that then um, opens you up to the world and it opens you up to like if you're a gardener it will open you up to new um, imagery in the soil and in the plants and in you're working with your hands. Um, and so whatever the application is, it's like, um, it has, I think there's something in that about how God made us in this physical way. And it doesn't intend for us to just be spiritual. He made us fully, um, fully human. And for some reason that gives him pleasure. You mm -hmm. know, he did mm -hmm. it on purpose. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, one of the things we also are so grateful for are the songs you've written, which become songs of whole communities. And so I'm wondering if we could talk a little bit about um, the vocation of the singer-songwriter and then the vocation of the singer-songwriter who writes for communities to sing. 
and some of what you've been learning about that, some of the joys, the struggles um, uh, about these two different, beautiful, but quite different roles in many ways. Uh, um, I've been serving at a local church in Nashville, in South Nashville, for the last two years, and a little more than two years, we planted a church, and um, and but prior to that, I was, I had been serving um, kind of long distance, but closely with a church in Houston, Texas, and had some friends there, and they were, they had asked me to come in, you know, uh, regularly to serve, and so both of those experiences those experiences were um, the catalyst for me uh, coming alive to writing songs for the church. And okay. in that, I would say it, it kind of had to be particular. It had to be like about particular people and not just like, I want to write songs for everybody and all the church people everywhere. And I think it, it became like, okay, what are the songs that that um, are missing from what we're singing and what are the songs we need? And mm -hmm. starting at that congregation in Houston, um, that was such a mutual gift to be able to, and the songs, um, We Will Feast and God's Highway were both written while I was in Houston and I was serving in that community. Mm -hmm. And then beginning the work in a, in a church plant in Nashville, so transitioning into that. And a lot of the songs on God's Highway were then formed out of my local church as well. So it would, I would say it's just like the practice, you sort of try it on. Mm -hmm. And um, all the years that I had spent as a vocational, like, uh, singer songwriter mm -hmm. um, have just it, you know it, it could go a lot of different ways there's great merit in there's not it's not more spiritual to write church music um, it's just my particular story it's just where I've gone but I do feel like it's um, equally sacred to God to make songs that are singer songwriter music yeah. as well and um, my story kind of mirrors, there's a psalm, Psalm 43 talks about, um, there, there's a, it's a very short psalm and there's six verses and right in the middle it kind of has a hinge point where it, sa it says, it goes from like the psalmist being downcast and asking for deliverance into this plea for send out your light and your truth and let them lead me to your holy hill. And on the hill you experience, like it, the psalmist talks about the altar of God, then I will go to the altar of God. So for me, there's been a story of like, okay, we're here doing a thing. The Lord gives me deliverance and direction and light on my path. And mm -hmm. for me, the path was toward the altar of God, literally that I would walk up to that altar and with the exceeding joy that mm -hmm. is God himself, I would proclaim it. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like that kind of is like this very old story that just I find myself in it. Mm -hmm. And so church music is very, um, it's coming out of, the, the center of it for me is the beauty of God, that God actually um, has a joy within himself that he imparts to us that is, like, impenetrable. Like, you can't remove it. You can't understand it. And it makes you feel all the things, angry, sad, all the things kind of bump up against it. But there's a joy and a delight in who he is that um, is at the center of church music for me. And so... Um, hmm. That's where I kind of, that's where I want to, you know, circle around, circle the wagons. Absolutely <laughs> wonderful. Well, and it's blessed so many uh, congregations in uh, many, many places. Wonderful. Uh, for the music students who are here or who are online, could you talk a little bit about the craft of writing music for communities to sing? So choices that you might make about vocal range or rhythms or um, a little bit the materials of music and some of the disciplines that really help pr produce good communal song. That's a great question and one that I'm still very much asking and learning. I'm a student of that and um, have, have identified things or seen some things over the years. One, one thing I've noticed is that as I started out, when I started writing songs in middle school or young teenager, I mostly could only write a melody that was kind of self-absorbed. It was around my voice, how it sounded, or what I was used to hearing or listening to on the radio or playing Broadway tunes or whatever I was into at the time. And those songs, um, from that starting point, I think once I started writing in church, in a church context, I realized like that is such a limited space. Like just the sound of my voice is not representative of this diverse body of people. 
Um, and as I got to know those particular people in our congregation, you start realizing what people hear and what they can sing and what they enjoy. So I think um, I've learned a lot from Marva Dawn, who I originally came across here at Calvin, and um, her writing on um, what it is to, to have this richness in our in each Sunday service that we would have a variation of songs and a range of um, styles and tempos and moods and emotions reflected in those songs. I think those are important things. Um, and then just in the stylistic, like the interpretation of my voice versus a congregation, I've learned to simplify. The biggest thing is just to simplify. Mm -hmm. um, and my kids have helped me with that. I have two kids that are elementary school age and they, writing songs with them, having them sing with me has, has taught me more than anything about what makes this a melody. Cause they'll tell you, like they'll tell you how it is. They'll be like, they don't want to sing it if it's not um, an enjoyable, a kind of magnetic melody. And if they do, it's a good sign, you know? And, and then if it's simple enough that they understand the concept, they know what they're singing about. And it, it's not that we would um, simplify to make things not a, it, I think the most beautiful things are really simple. Mm -hmm. And as I've kind of grown and got, as I've gotten older, I realize that is something I maybe resisted when I was younger. I wanted things complicated and like brooding and you ha mysterious. And it's like, okay, they are that. But can we just say what we mean and hmm. speak it to each other as a means of communicating, not as a means hmm. of just self-reflection? Hmm. Mentioning your kids, um, you've done some writing for children too, children's songs, right? And, and um, can, what a beautiful gift. And you, and you can talk a little bit about the partnerships that are, and what you've been learning through that process. of. Yes. Um, after a few years in having really young children, um, some friends and I... Um, in Nashville, we came together around this idea of writing children's songs that um, that you could listen to on repeat and not just for the kids, but for everybody. And we, we had this vision or hope that that was possible. Because, you know, you, you learn these songs when you're in summer camp and you're a little kid and you can't get the songs out of your head and most of them are just you wish you could get them out of your head <laughs> and so there we felt like there was a need um in, that we wanted to write songs f for our children and for the children in our community that would know that they're loved and would know the truths of god when they um are at such a, a receptive age to be able to absorb it and hold it and so um this is a project called rain for roots and we've done three albums the first was a partnership with Sally Lloyd-Jones, who wrote the Jesus Storybook Bible. And Sally had these poems about, uh, for very young children, like five and under. And that was our first CD and our first music. And um, I still go back to that. It's a, if I have anxiety, those songs are so calming to me because they remind me that in the storm or in, with the lions or in these experiences that are, um, these stories we've heard a thousand times, um, we realize that God is the hero of the story, and he continues to be the one who fights for us. So that, that's been in such a sweet project. And then we did a, uh, an album around the parables, and then the third one is um, an, kind of a Advent-based or Lent-based. It's, it's called Waiting Songs. And man, a lot of childhood is about waiting, and a lot of adulthood is about waiting. And this waiting on the Lord that's expectant and hopeful, so that's been, um, I really, and it's grown because as our kids have grown, the songs have had to sort of expand with them and, um, and expanding with the community and you hear different voices as the time has gone on. Mm -hmm. Listening to you talk, I'm thinking about how um, tempting it is in children's ministry in a church or as parents to, um, to lead with high energy, but then to not have those moments that are, well, back to what we started, that are more contemplative and just how important that um, those quiet moments are in cultivating that capacity for silence or silence together. Uh, but that's what I hear as you talk through some of the themes, that maybe this is like psalms that are age appropriate in this contemplative space uh, a little bit. Is that, is that been yeah, part of the experience? I had not thought about it in those, that way, but mm -hmm. I think it was um, the idea of contemplative work had not um, 
hmm. it had not come into my imagination when we started the Rain for Roots project, but it has those attributes. And okay. I think God was already kind of unpacking that for hmm. me and sending me down that road. And I would say within our community that I marvel at how the kids, very young kids can learn silence and they can learn to read scripture. Like if you have it read three times with silence in between and you ask the children, like, what do you hear? I mean, the most amazing things. They Absolutely. hear all the things that we yep. hear, you know, and, and they're even more. I mean, it's like it's it's uh, not to be diminished what their capacity is for the profound. Absolutely. Absolutely. In a few minutes, we'll have questions here throughout the group. Uh, I'd love to ask you, though, yet a few things. Um, uh, being in the Nashville community, so at the heart of music industry there, um, what advice do you have for us as listeners, as uh, consumers in some way of what Nashville produces. Um, how if I were gonna, we were gonna have a vigorous discussion in the class about what it would look like to sanctify our Spotify accounts. Um, what would you give us advice? How to be good listeners? Well, um, I, you know, I, I think of, I, th I've, I experience the world as much more connected. So mm -hmm. even though I'm in Nashville, I experience community here. I experience community in Houston, in these places, in, in Louisville, where we were last night. I mean, I experience it by relationship. So I would say um, there are so many opportunities to support and to um, kind of look for people that are making art that's beautiful and that's true and that reflects those things reflects God's fingerprints in those ways, not all of which would be just um, followers of Jesus, but finding and supporting beautiful and true art. Mm -hmm. And that's going to come in a lot of different ways. It's going to come in surprising ways. I know that um, streaming and, there, I mean, the, the form or the medium of which we experience music is always going to change. I don't really have a lot of fear about that. Hmm. Um, I don't, I'm not going to get on a, a soapbox about, like, this platform or that platform because I, it's just not how I'm wired. I just think there will be things that we need to kind of lament and it's like, oh man, it's just not, this thing, this system is broken. It doesn't work anymore. Whatever the system is, if it's tapes, <laughs> if it's like, you yeah. know, whatever the system is and just letting go of it and holding our hands open while put, making the effort to support um, artists that are making work that is beautiful and true and trying to affirm and fan the flame of that in whatever ways that we can. And I think those things can make a huge difference mm -hmm. because we can be more directly connected. Mm -hmm. So you can go to an artist's website or you can support somebody at a, at a venue or at a house show, or there's just so many ways of like real relationships forming communities and the community supporting the art and the artist supporting the community. And this kind of all just works together when it works. Yeah in a vigorous discussion earlier this week about the music industry and what it's been really good at, but there was some concern in this conversation expressed about um, the ways that it has tended to promote more soloistic music as opposed to congregational music, or the way it's pressured congregational music to imitate music written for solo singers. And you live right in that tension. Um, it, it, do you think that is a tension that's sort of built into the industry? And this is meant to be just an appreciative question of what are the joys and challenges of working with what the, the economy as it's set up right now? How, how do you experience that? Oh, that's an, I would have loved to hear more of that conversation. Um, and my first instinct is that it's a universal question and not just unique to the music yeah, industry. Right. And that yeah. it's a question of like personhood yeah. versus people using each other. Mm -hmm. So if you have people that are honoring of each other, if it's in music, that even if it's a solo album, that um, that it would have a collaborative feel. And I think that that's different than the old days of like a heavy handed producer who mm -hmm. comes in and says like, we're gonna do it this way and I'm gonna tell you how it is. And I think, um, while there is some something great that can be produced but from that, mm -hmm. like you, um, I, I think that my experience in church music, like working with the musicians each week, preparing for the Sunday service, is so gratifying because it's not mm -hmm. about a performance; it's about um, personhood, and we are joining together. And in in meeting as who we are, 
we are all trying to hear more from each other. And when that happens, there's mutuality and there's like something really special that couldn't happen if it was just me. Mm -hmm. And I could lead every week, but there would be a, a different level. There would, there's just such a limit to that. Mm -hmm. It's just, I'm just able to do one thing, you know? And when we all get together, we are just surprised regularly at what happens um, because of the Spirit of God working in that prism form, you know, like all the different shades of color. So in the audience here and probably online also, there are um, many people who relish that, um, helping other people sing well, the, uh, the collaboration. Uh, but any thoughts about how that could be, how we can teach that mm. and how we can make that more public? Um, because it does still strike me as a minority voice. Um, this deep desire to enable and encourage mutual flourishing um, when we live in a world that's so dominated by solo performance models, and that's true, not just in music, but in pretty much any art form. Uh, any thoughts about how to encourage that, a culture of that, I guess, is really what I'm getting at. I think... Gosh, what a great question. I would love to keep asking that question. And um, I wonder if it has a lot to do with how our churches flourish hmm. as well. Like if you think of a parallel example would be like a small group. And if you have a small group with like a very dominant leader um, and everybody like that dominant leader is required for that, that entity to work each time that you meet. Um, versus a collaborative group that supports each other, that is, everyone brings their vulnerability and their strength in helping and supporting each other. Mm -hmm. So I think that that sort of discipleship structure, if that's happening where, another example in that, within that is like, if somebody has a crisis, um, if the rest of the group doesn't try to fix the crisis, like how can we make this crisis go away, but just give space around it and, Again, you're affirming personhood and you're not coming in to fix, but we're expecting the Lord to fill the space hmm. for that and, and for whatever needs to be resolved. And I think in those ways, we practice it. We practice it in the most, um, in those quiet and everyday moments of our lives, whether it's the small group or whether it's our family dynamics, getting out of the door to school or to work, how we treat each other. These moments are when we actually practice what it is to collaborate hmm. and to say, uh, I could probably do it better. Wait, could I? Hmm. You know, and to, to like step back and like let it breathe for a second. Hmm. And um, it's it's a slow change, but it's so magnetic when it's happening. Mm -hmm. And to to be awake to the spirit of God and to the humility of what what is in Philippians two that Christ emptied himself and became obedient to death. So if Christ is demonstrating that, hmm. to humble himself. Um, how much more then do we um, do we have an opportunity to do the same? Absolutely, good. I'd love to open it up for questions that you might have for Sandra this afternoon. Comments about her music or other experiences as a musician. I probably have thirty more questions to ask, but I want to make sure we give a little space here. So, comments, questions. Are some of you musicians or songwriters? Go ahead. Um, yes, uh, the questions around um, some of the most singable melodies. I, I think the most singable melodies are those folk songs that have endured um, kind of across continents or different places, and they can be applied and dressed up in different ways. Um, so tunes like Come Thou Fount, or so those, those Welsh and Irish tunes tend to be very singable. Um, also the spirituals, like that are very singable without a, any accompaniment. I think that's a, when I think of songwriting craft, that's 
one of my favorite ways to explore songwriting is like not using an instrument so that you actually hear if the melody holds up without embellishment around it or without any other support. And that's another thing around singing with children. I mean, if children can sing it, it has that same singability. And then from there, kind of building it. And some of there are modern tunes that have some of those characteristics. Um, but I have found that certainly the folk tunes have been enduring and in, um, in my experience. Good. Other comments? Can you actually, uh, Sandra, actually walk us through like a song we're going to hear tonight and the, the stages it goes through? So we just talked about an early stage, the melody and the shaping of that. And then kind of take us through the different stages that lead to yeah, what we'll experience. Uh, that's, a t <laughs> that's I've never been asked that. Um, thank you. The, I think of one of the songs we'll do tonight, it's called Trinity Song. Hmm. And it's a very um, simple, two, like two little parts of the song, so it's not even like verse, chorus, bridge, it's just two little parts. And I originally wrote it, I was, um, I was overseas, I was in Portugal for a conference for about a week, and I was there doing music, and I was with a bunch of scientists, and it was so good, but, and so cerebral for about a week, and I didn't have a lot of solitude, and at the end of the week, maybe the last day or two, I had a little bit of time out on the beach, and I walked out on the beach, and I was just walking and just finally kind of had this quiet, and the quiet meaning there was an ocean roaring next to me, but the quiet, and as I was walking, that song just started rolling around in my head, and it was coming out of conversation, it was coming out of scripture, it was coming out of a lot of things, mm -hmm. but meditating on the um, this very simple, small idea um, that is huge to unpack is the Trinity, like Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So in that song, um, the first uh, seed of it was really just me walking down the beach and then I didn't write it down I just sang it so I sang the first part and then I sang the second part and I wondered if they could be sung in the round but of course it was just me so <laughs> I couldn't really practice that so I came back um, and then later that day I, I sang the first part and kind of recorded it into a little recorder and and then kind of played the second part and sang it over my own voice with the recorder and it was um, it it fit right in, and so we've we've done that one a lot in our church services and in the liturgy. And then when, and now when we've been doing it on the Vesper tour, it it's less structured. Like it doesn't just have um, a very succinct form. It kind of changes every night. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we'll sing the first part um, almost entire in in its you know almost entirely, maybe one time through the second, and other times it just meanders and the band will play a little longer and. So I think, um, I, I, and it's a song of invitation, and so by saying come with your peace and your invitation, it, it's also a very useful song in how it brings us into a space as God invites us and as he's already here before we invite each other or before we, you know, just knowing and acknowledging that. So mm -hmm. it's the second song, I think, in our list tonight. Wonderful. Look forward to it already. Thank That's you. wonderful. <laughs> So we at Calvin are reading a new book by uh, Sui Hong Lim and Lester Ruth on the history of contemporary worship. It's a fa fascinating book, and there are chapters on the differences that have emerged in worship song over the past 50 years. And there are many things we could talk about. One of them is that uh, contemporary worship songs in the 70s and 80s were by and large fairly simple in form, first response. And then at some point, um, a bridge became not only an occasional thing, but built into almost every song. And then songs tended to become longer. It's fascinating the length of time the average contemporary worship song takes. So I, I, I'd love to ask songwriters, um, how, does, how does that work, writing the bridge? <laughs> I think it's actually a really interesting question. Um, how does that work and what if you think about song form and what that bridge does, how, how would you put it kind of in, uh, in your own words? I'm trying to get a read if you like the bridge in the song or if you don't. I can't I totally often, tell. I <laughs> often love it. Not always, but I often do. Yeah. That's a good answer. Um, I don't know. I, you know, I, I'm coming at that from, both, like from singer-songwriter right. music, exactly. which bridge is also very important. Right. Um, 
I f- it can be in a in a can, like in a worship setting, a bridge I feel like throws a wrench in very mm-hmm. often because mm-hmm. you're having to teach another part. But if it's if it's almost a simplification of the other parts that are going on, it works really well. Okay. So it's not a lot to learn. I think if they're complex, mm-hmm. so I guess I've never even thought about that. But I think if it's simpler and um, for me, a, an ideal bridge would be like almost one chord. But it, it, it serves a little bit like when you're eating um, sushi and the ginger's on the side and the ginger goes between when you're switching what you're eating. It's, um, it's a way of like pa- palate cleansing, you mm-hmm. know, and you're, you kind of, it, it gives you a little, um, a jolt if it's done well, like where you kind of think, okay, let me hear it again. And then you go back to the refrain after the bridge and you're experiencing it in a new way. So it, it does serve a really useful um, place in the song and in the kind of the emotional arc of what you're experiencing when you're singing corporate worship. But there are times even with the songs that I've recorded on an album that if you're listening to uh, a song in the car, it's a different thing than if you're in a congregation Mm -hmm. singing together. So I would more likely welcome a bridge in the car setting and then in the congregational setting, I tend to go for hymn hymn format, Mm -hmm. like very straightforward, not guitar solos, not like, and not because they're not beautiful, but because um, they tend to trip people up. And, mm-hmm. I, and I think part of hospitality is like helping people to know what to expect so that they can go with you and not like leaving them there. Like, I mean, and that's kind of some of the song, I mean, some of like the contemporary pop music has influenced worship music where you'll have a great singer who's singing like in the low octave and then they jump to the high octave. And it's like, that's awesome, but nobody can do that <laughs> except you. Right. So hospitality in in our melodies even? I mean, it's it's a good question to ask. Yeah, that's good. Well, and there's something that you even said that has comes back to that question of uh, simplicity uh, and the beauty of that and, and how it works. But yes, it can often be a beautiful way to, um, to linger too, right? It sets up that final return in a lingering way and can be beautiful. Maybe we ought to create a list of our hundred favorite bridges. What do you think? And and actually see what we can learn actually from that. I think there'd be some interesting patterns to discover. Yeah, Yeah, that's good. Comments or questions? Anyone want to follow up on that aspect? Do you have thoughts about what's next for you after um, some of the things you'd love to get to in the next few years that you haven't had had time to get to? I have been in a season of pruning, like trying to cut back and really mm-hmm. get to the the real uh, mm-hmm. core of what I want to do. Um, and I think in the next little bit, I'd love to do a podcast where there's more conversation. So mm-hmm. another creative mode where I can talk to people and hear their stories. Mm-hmm. And I'm not interested in the podcast or the, that, that side of it, but I would love hearing people share their stories. And so I think doing something like that, it feels... Like it would give a little, um, a little more room for imagination and for um, listening, mm-hmm. and maybe even what you mentioned before. I love that question of like, how do we cultivate um, a life that is collaborative? Mm-hmm. And collaborative life, I feel like, goes there. And another thing I'd love to do more of is writing, and writing just takes time. Uh, it takes more time and space. And so as I'm making more time and space, I find the desire to write. I've always journaled, like just. Um, to help me process whatever life is happening for me. But um, I think um, now that I'm this far out of like the academic thing and I don't have to write, I think, oh, maybe I want to write. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's, it's um, kind of coming back to me as an, as, a, as an old joy that I'm experiencing again. Some students here about ready to graduate and they too one day yes. will have that discovery <laughs> again. Right. Yeah, you I think that's probably right. That's right. <laughs> Uh, I, we also have here, and probably online, um, people who would love to do what you do and are gifted uh, as musicians, songwriters, people of faith. How would you encourage them? In other words, what would be the things maybe others wouldn't think to suggest for somebody who really would love to grow as a singer-songwriter? Hmm. Um, there are so many ways to walk the path, um, but I would say... Um, moving toward light in the path and not toward grasping but toward releasing 
and by releasing. Like, if you want it really bad, um, bring it before the Lord and open your hands. Mm -hmm. And I think um, in that place, I think he has, for me, he has shown me that my desires are, I think there. I grew up with, you know, you have a certain set of things, whether it's from watching Disney movies or, or your parents or the people you look up to, but you think you know what you want. Hmm. And the Lord has shown me that, that that scripture is so often misused, like delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. It's so, um, I think it, it can be so captured for so many agendas. But the, the real subject of that is the beauty of God. And by um, committing yourself to know and pursue the beauty of God, you will never miss out on what your desire is because then you find that he transforms our desires to become more um, truly who we are and who we were made to be. And it's not going to be what you think, and it's going to be great. And so, but it's, it's sometimes really painful getting to that. And that by way of, it's like that image of Eustace in C.S. Lewis's story where Eustace becomes a dragon and he has to have the scales pulled off so that he can actually become a boy again. And this way that God brings us back to who we, um, Frederick Buechner would say, like we each have a shimmering self. Hmm. So if, it's, if it is in this space, if it is in music, if it is in teaching, if it is in speaking or writing or songs, Whatever it is, like the Lord is, um, is like the beauty and the center that when you move toward him and open your hands, like you will see your own self to shimmer in that way too. That's so. beautiful. Wonderful. I also want to make sure we have a minute uh, for you to um, say a little bit about your collaborators tonight because we'll meet all of you. But say a little bit about uh, the particular delight you take in the collaboration and could we just introduce the crew to us or the group with you uh, yes. tonight? Yes, yeah. thank you. Um, so I met these guys, so Isaac Wardell, who's been a friend to Calvin and I met here at Calvin, he is a worship leader in Charlottesville, Virginia. And we were all hired to be in the same band with him in Philadelphia some years ago, maybe four or five years ago. And um, just connected and then, uh, and as you do, you'll say like, oh yeah, if you're ever in New York or if you're ever in Nashville, we should play music or we should, and, and that never, it doesn't often happen. And <laughs> in our case, it did. And um, I huh. was up in New York not long after that and I was like, okay, I'm doing a hymn sing. Do you guys, you really wanna do this? And so um, there, were, there were several different configurations of the band as I would visit New York. I kept calling them and trying to, you know, come up with reasons to play music with them. But one of the things I love about playing with Jay, so Jay Foote is the bass player and Spencer Cohen is the drummer. And one of the things I love is, um, is how uh, I've learned to, I've learned more about who I am by playing with them because hmm. they so respect and honor personhood and, and they so respect and listen to each other and to me. And I've played with a lot of musicians that are so talented and a lot of talented musicians just want to hear themselves play. Hmm. And these guys just, are they have a generosity about the way they play music that ever I mean it just I light up with it and um, so we don't live in the same place so we'll meet and then play some shows and that also keeps it really fun because it's like it's a treat every time to get to like come somewhere and, and meet and play songs and and um, on a musical level I have always specialized in like ballads and in melancholy <laughs> for better or worse. And so playing with these guys, I think also um, Jay's bass playing, when we've both, he and I have co-produced the last few albums together as well. And um, in that experience, I think Jay brings such a buoyancy to the music that I've written. And I am so grateful for that. Like, it's like there's a lightness, there's just an implied joy because the play, the way mm. he plays that instrument mm. and who he is brings such a like, and I hear it when he plays. And so in friendship, it's like it spills over into the notes that come out. And so we have a lot of fun. Oh, that's Thanks wonderful. for asking. Oh, yeah. No, we look, look forward to seeing it. Any other questions anyone would like to ask here? Such wonderful conversation to share. Any questions you'd like to ask us or anyone here in the room? Any, anyone? Go ahead.
think I'm not an expert on it, but in our local church, what I have enjoyed is trying out different, we follow the church calendar. So um, it's a, the church calendar is a very uh, helpful tool to be able to, try, as a music, like as the one who chooses the songs, I can um, play with a, an idea for a season. So like I can do spirituals during Lent, that's what we did like last year. And then we learned all these songs, and we learned different interpretations of how other people knew these songs. So we did, we kind of tried it on, and then a handful of those songs really became like our songs. So you, leaning into the changes in the different times of year can be really helpful. So Easter or Christmas and um, Advent, and then you've got this long stretch of summertime, like ordinary time. That one is. Um, is a little more like low key. You can try out a lot of things and just see what happens. Um, but I think it's it's uh, a, a place that you want to be attentive to the the particular people that are in the congregation. And I think that's so important to not generalize or just to think, well, this song is really popular right now, and everybody's. I don't even know. I, I don't exactly know how that works. <laughs> you know, because I guess it's like. I, I'm not tuned into like charts or radio in terms of worship music, but I'm definitely tuned into our people, and I want to I want to respond I want to hear from them, and I can tell on a Sunday. Sometimes I can tell like they just don't know it yet, and we need a few more weeks. Other times I can tell that it's it's um, genuinely awkward or difficult for them to access this song, and it's okay to try it and not work. You know, but I I have really enjoyed how particular that cra that um, craft is, like how the it's a dialogue, and and when it starts to really uh, take hold, then you start seeing it as a young church, just being a little over two years, um, it probably took eight months to a year before I could really tell what our songs are, you know, kind of pulling us along, like, and I've I've found because we're from it's an Anglican church but there are people from all kinds of denominational backgrounds a lot of most of us I would say are new to that tradition so I've leaned heavily on the traditional hymns and it's a great middle ground and it just works it's just it's theologically rich um, there's there it's rich emotionally and in terms of the stories that it tells and how you can find yourself in it um, so it's been a good kind of core place and then adding in contemporary songs and like you said like earlier contemporary songs and then new pieces um has has been that's kind of how i see it like a flower where the middle is the hymns and then everything grows from out there you did say something so interesting when you said something about saying spirituals and some of them became our songs and we've heard that from some other guests that we've had too who seem to have this ability to recognize that moment. It's probably a deep intuitive judgment. That song took hold. Uh, there's something uh, that became our song. And um, I think that's a, we, that'd be a fun thing to explore more. You know, what um, are people looking for, moment, for songs that do that and cultivating that? Yeah. I mean, maybe to just close, any, any thoughts about that recognition? What you intuit? when a song becomes owned and loved. And this is a great segue into We Will Feast because that song has become dearly loved by so many communities, yeah. I, I would say it is intuitive more than verbal feedback. Yeah. Um, and I wonder if some of it is just empirically, if some of it is like the, la like the volume, like that we are really singing. You can really hear it when people sing. And just, I can see, I can ex experience, like, empathetically, I can see people's emotional responses. Mm -hmm. So not just that people are, are in tears or whatever, but you can just feel the energy in the room that, like, people are um, resonating. And there have been also some, like, stories and just surprising feed that things that are more like feedback where somebody that you don't expect will choose a song that you didn't expect and pull it out of the bulletin and put it in his wallet and yeah. carry it around. And you're yeah. like, I didn't even, I would never have guessed that. You yeah. know, and those little moments, I just kind of, uh -huh, I'm paying attention <laughs> and taking notes for what you enjoy. And, um, and yeah, I think we all feel it together. Yeah, that's good. Wonderful. Thank you all for coming. Thanks to our online audience. But special thanks, Sandra, for being here this afternoon and especially tonight. Thanks so much. Join me in thanking. It's wonderful. <laughs>